back, and thank you for listening to Trekker Talk, a fan podcast devoted to the adventures of 23rd century bounty hunter Mercy St. Clair from the pages of Trekker Comics by creator, writer, and artist Ron Randall. I'm Ruth. And I'm Darren. And normally we talk about Trekker, the excellent adventure comics written and illustrated by Ron Randall, about sci-fi bounty hunter Mercy St. Clair. But this time we have another one of our occasional tangent episodes. In the past, we featured tangent episodes on Supergirl and Star Wars that featured art by Ron Randall, and we covered his work on Justice League Spectacular to coincide with the release of Batman v Superman. Ruth recently put her expert budget travel skills to work and found a great bargain on a tour to Scandinavia, and we thought that since we were in the land of the Vikings, that it would be the perfect time to cover Thor and Loki in the land of the Giants, written by Jeff Lemke with art by Ron Randall. This is not Marvel's Thor and Loki but rather an educational comic that covers the Norse mythology of these two characters. It's part of the graphic myths and legends series from Lerner Publishing that consists of more than two dozen books. Other volumes focus on characters like King Arthur, Robin Hood, Hercules, William Tell, and many others. Ron Randall did the art for a handful of these books, including Tristan and Isolde, a British legend, and Amaterasu, a Japanese myth. The Thor and Loki book is about 50 pages long and was published in 2007. It's available in a printed edition or digitally from the Amazon Kindle store. And stay tuned later in the episode when we'll share some of the great comments and feedback we've received since last time. But before we get started, let's have a brief introduction to Trekker Talk for those listening for the first time. This is a fan podcast. We're not affiliated with Ron Randall and the opinions expressed are just ours. We do the podcast simply because we love reading and talking about Trekker and Ron Randall's other comics. For those of you unfamiliar with Trekker, it's a fast-paced adventure series about bounty hunter Mercy St. Clair. She lives in the city of New Gellif, on Earth in the 23rd century. The stories vary from star-spanning sci-fi adventures to dark noir mysteries set in the dangerous back streets of New Gellif, as well as retro westerns like the current story Chapel Town. The series is filled with action, adventure, science fiction, a fully realized world, and well-rounded and interesting characters. We encourage everyone to check it out. So please consider visiting TrekkerComic.com. That's Ron Randall's official site dedicated to Mercy St. Clair. It features a new page of Trekker material each Monday, making it easy to sample the many great things Trekker has to offer. you also find links to all of the ways to follow Ron Randall on social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram, as well as a link to his Patreon page where you can donate to help support the creation of brand new Trekker material if you want. Also at the Trekker Comic website, you'll occasionally find interesting posts on Thursday. That's where Ron Randall occasionally shares key inspirations and insights into how he creates comics, as well as the latest news about Mercy St. Clair. A recent post slyly titled The Future Quest is Now talks about the new comic Future Quest. It features the characters from the classic 1960s animated series Johnny Quest, along with characters from other Hanna-Barbera cartoons, including Space Ghost, the Herculoids, and Birdman. Jeff Parker, a studio mate of Ron's, writes the series, and it is usually drawn by Evan Shaner. Fans of Johnny Quest like us will certainly enjoy that new comic series, and fans of Ron Randall's art will find that he helped out with some of the art for issue two. If you go to trekkercomic.com, you can see the step-by-step stages of one of the pages that he did for the book. And this isn't Ron Randall's first experience drawing Johnny Quest. He also worked on some issues of The Real Adventures of Johnny Quest for Dark Horse Comics that tied into the television series that ran for a couple of seasons in the 1990s. For more information about Future Quest, check out Supermates episode 58 with Chris and Cindy Franklin. They cover the first two issues on their excellent show. I'm looking forward to any comments on Future Quest and the Thor and Loki book that we'll cover today. It's a lot of fun to read and share your comments. So let us know what you think. So stop by trekkertalk.com for links to all of our social media connections or send us an email at trekkertalk at gmail.com and we'll include your comments in a future episode. Thor and Loki in the Land of Giants, a Norse Myth. Story by Jeff Lemke. Pencils and inks by Ron Randall. Colors by Hi-Fi Design. Lettering by Bill Housen. A chariot being pulled by two goats races through the countryside. Thor is at the reins with a stern look on his face, while Loki grasps tightly to the sides of the chariot. As the chariot swerves around the many twists and turns in the road, Loki is thrown from side to side. The two gods are verbally squabbling as brothers in spirit are prone to do. They're talking about leaving Asgard to journey to the land of the giants, 
and they're disagreeing over whether brains or brawn are best for solving problems. As evening approaches, they stop at a small farmhouse and ask to stay the night. As the tall and muscular figure of Thor towers over them, the nervous farmer quickly agrees, though he explains there will be little for supper. He barely has enough to feed his two children. Not to worry, Thor says. Loki will take care of that. That evening, Thor, Loki, the farmer, and his children, the daughter Roskova, and son, Thialfi, feast on the two goats, but the boy wonders aloud how the two gods will travel the next day. Thor points to the two goat skins spread upon the floor and tells the family to throw all of the bones onto the skins, but to be careful not to break any. The next morning, Thor strolls out of the farm to find his two goats newly reformed, but one has a broken leg. In a rage, he demands to know what happened, and the boy confesses that he broke one of the bones. Thor raises his hammer as though poised to strike the boy, when the father intervenes, asking Thor to strike him instead. The farmer then offers to have his children guide Thor and Loki to the land of giants. He explains his son can take their fishing boat for the journey, and his daughter can be their cook. Thor leaves his two goats in the farmer's care, promising in return to take care of his children. In the boat, Thor and Loki continue their discussion of brains versus brawn, as Thor claims it was his brawn that created the fear in the farmer and got them the use of the boat and the children as guides, while Loki points out it was the farmer's brains in making the offer that kept him and his children safe. In the distance, the boy spots land, and soon their boat comes ashore on an island of truly giant proportions as trees reach far into the sky. Even the grass towers above our group of travelers. As dark approaches, Thor sends the boy ahead to scout out for a place for the night since he is a fast runner. The boy finds a cave where they can spend the night and leads them to it. Loki leans against the cave wall to relax, and the girl begins to cook their dinner. However, when they hear strange noises coming from the forest, Thor encourages everyone to move deeper into the cave. He then goes outside and raises his hammer to the sky and commands a storm to drive away any beast roaming in the forest. When Thor joins the others, he is surprised to see five additional branches deep in the cave. He definitely thinks there is something strange about their surroundings. The next morning, as the group steps out into the daylight, they are shocked to see a giant towering far above them. The members of our group are barely as tall as his feet. The giant speaks, saying, Good morning, travelers. I see you found my glove. As the giant picks up the glove, Thor realizes it was what they thought was a cave, and the five odd passages in the cave were actually the finger holes of the giant's glove. The giant introduces himself as Skrimir and asks where the travelers are headed. The girl quickly volunteers that they are going to see the king of the giants, and Skrimir encourages them all to travel together. He offers his hand to the group for a relaxing ride, but Thor is unwilling to join the others and instead runs along the ground trying to keep up with the giant's long strides. That night, Skrimir and the children are asleep, but Thor and Loki are hungry and are looking for food. The giant told them they were welcome to food from his sack, but Thor is unable to untie the giant laces sealing the bag. In frustration, he repeatedly pounds his hammer on the giant's head, trying to wake him, but all he is able to do is momentarily wake the giant, who thinks that an acorn has fallen on his head before going immediately back to sleep. The next morning, the giant is refreshed and ready to travel. They soon arrive at the city of the Frost Giants, and Skrimir warns them to be humble, saying the giants won't take kindly to them being boastful. This angers Thor, and when they come to a door that Skrimir says they can't enter unless they can prove their strength, Thor leaps over the giant's foot and pulls the door open with his bare hands. Stepping inside, Thor tells the king of the giants to bring on any challenges. Loki tries to intervene and apologize for Thor's actions, but the king says the challenges have been accepted and all of the travelers must participate, except for the girl, which angers Roskova, but she has told the giants get to make the rules. And I don't like that rule either. The first challenge goes to the boy. Since he is fast, it is a race. But even though the boy is very fast indeed, he is unable to outrun a giant. The next challenge goes to Loki, who Thor says can eat more than anyone. But he has no chance against a giant, as they lose another challenge. An angry Thor decides he will do all of the remaining challenges. The first is to drink all of the contents of a giant horn. And while his effort is admirable, Thor loses this challenge. Next, he must lift a cat completely off of the ground. While Thor is able to lift the cat over his head, the giant cat's long legs still touch the ground, so he loses that challenge as well. For the final challenge, Thor must wrestle an elderly woman. 
but he is so small compared to the giant that she easily flicks him away with her fingers. In defeat, the travelers turn to walk away and leave the island. Outside, they see the giant, Skrimir, for the first time since they entered the building. He looks upon their sad faces and then confesses he and the other giants have not been truthful to them. Before their eyes, Skrimir transforms into the king. He saw them on their boat in the distance as they approached the island. He knew of Thor's strength and anger and was worried, so he chose to meet them at the shore in disguise, and he used magic to cloud their minds. Thor never struck the giant's head with a hammer. Instead, Thor repeatedly hit the ground where each of the swings of his hammer created large valleys. The boy did not race another giant, but rather he raced thought itself, and nothing is faster than thought. And Loki did not compete against another giant, but rather a raging fire that consumed everything. Thor did not drink from a giant horn, but from the ocean itself, and he drank so much that he revealed several new islands. The cat he tried to lift was the Midgard Serpent, which is so large its tail wraps around the globe, and the elderly woman was in fact time, and no one can defeat time. Thor raises his hammer and says he will destroy the giants for tricking him. The king replies, he knew this is how Thor would respond, and says that having beaten him, they ask that he never looks for them again. One more magical spell finds Thor and the other travelers back on the mainland. The brotherly squabbling starts immediately, as Loki laughingly tells Thor that the giants beat him with their brains, but Thor responds that they may have tricked Loki the trickster with their brains, but they did not beat Thor's brawn. The cover features Thor in a dramatic pose, raising his hammer toward the sky with lightning all around. Loki is in the background, his cape billowing in the wind. Inside is a map of Scandinavia, including Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland, along with Great Britain, Iceland, Russia, and Northern Europe to establish the location. There is a brief introduction after the title page explaining that Thor's and Loki's adventures can be traced back to a prose poem from Iceland around the year 1200. The introduction also mentions several of the sources researched by writer Jeff Lemke and artist Ron Randall to bring the story to life. So let's take a few minutes to talk about our favorite pages and panels. Ruth, what were some of your favorite pages? I do have a few to share, but first want to mention how impressed I am with the perspectives and portrayal of the size differences between the giants and our main characters. I'm sure it was a challenge to lay out and make it look just right. I love the opening title page on page number six, where we shift from seeing a few goats grazing on the land to the chariot pulling into view at a rapid clip. I was surprised to see that this was pulled by goats, I didn't know that that was part of the myth, and it was a good introduction for me. I appreciate how their hair and capes are blowing due to the speed, and Loki is having to grip the side to keep his balance. Now flip over to page 10. Okay. There I like the poses and expressions used in each panel to show the anger of Thor. That emotion is easily conveyed visually. Words are not even required there. Uh, that's right. Then all the way over on page 25. Okay, just a minute. And that's where the giant is sleeping on the ground, and they are trying to untie the drawstring of the bag of food. I love the nighttime colors on the page, with the deep blue sky and the moonlight. And again, the perspectives are executed so well. I really like the colors there, too. Well, Darren, what did you like best? So, for me, let's turn back to page 9. That's the dinner that Thor and Loki have with the farmer and his children. It's a page of people sitting at the table talking, but the great variety of close-ups, pullbacks, and different angles keeps the page interesting. I agree with you there. I like it. And then if we turn over to pages 13 and 14, I'll take those two together. That's the journey across the ocean in the fishing boat. The ocean waves are tossing the boat all around. And as with the dinner scene, there is a great variety of close-ups and distance images and lots of different angles, making the page very dynamic. I love that. It does look like the boat is in motion. You can really feel it. Yes, and I love everything about page 15, the very next page, so it's my favorite. It starts with the panel of the fishing boat coming ashore, and you can feel the movement of the boat as it plows into the sand on the beach. The page then ends with a pullback where we see our four travelers standing on shore beside the boat with a forest of tall trees towering over them. It's a great perspective. So now let's take a look at some of our favorite panels. Okay. If you will go to page 19. And okay, that's close. Find the next to the last panel. There, Thor is using his hammer to start a fire with a small lightning bolt. The colors of the bolt are great, and I love the camera angle that places Thor almost horizontal and includes a great close up of the hammer and the lightning. Yeah, I like that. 
Then, if you'll turn over to page 22 and see the last panel, I think it's a winner because, in part, I appreciate clues. This panel shows the branches in the cave. I thought it was an odd design, but never guessed it was a glove. I didn't pick up on the clues at the time, but really appreciated them once I knew more. I also think the use of the light from the fire and the shadows it creates are nicely done. I'm glad you drew my attention to that. It is good to go back and look at that and see how we could have figured it out if we had been thinking about it. And my very top choice is just back one page on number 21. I think it's a classic. Thor is creating a storm in the dark sky. The lightning and wind and Thor all look so powerful and frightening. Yeah, I do. I like that one, too. So for me, for my favorite panels, first I just want to say that there are lots of great images of Thor throughout the book. He seems to be a perpetually angry guy, but (laughs) I was really impressed with how much variety there was to the different images of him. Ron Randall really did a great job keeping the character fresh and interesting throughout the story, even though he seemed to only have one emotion. (laughs) So if we go to page seven at the bottom, the chariot has just gone around a sharp turn and Loki is completely horizontal as he desperately tries to hang on to the side of the chariot. It's a very funny drawing. Oh, I agree. That one made me laugh. And then flipping over to page 13 at the top is a great view of our four travelers in the fishing boat on the way to the island. As I mentioned in my pages review, that whole sequence is nice, and this is my favorite panel from that sequence. I agree with you. It's it's really special. And then on over to page 21 in the center. This is one of those many great images of Thor, and it's one you just mentioned. His hammer is raised in the sky as he commands a storm to keep beasts away while they sleep at night. I just had to choose that one. But we'll turn over to page 18. And it may seem like an odd choice, but this is my favorite panel. It's at the very bottom. It's a funny image of Thor and Loki starting into one of their squabbles. That one image just captures the personalities of both of them perfectly, in my opinion. Nice choice. Next up is Trekker Transmissions, where we share the listener feedback we've received since last time. A big thanks to everyone for all of the great comments. They add so much to the show. We really appreciate everyone who took the time to write in or get in touch through social media. Before we get started, we want to thank the good Professor Allen for the wonderful gift of comics that he gave us when we had the chance to meet up when he passed through our town. The wonderful bundle of comics included Adam Strange, which I hadn't read in many years, and it was great to revisit the character. Also included were some of the excellent Doctor Who comics from Titan and IDW. This included the fun Four Doctors crossover from Free Comic Book Day, as well as several issues with the Ninth Doctor, who is a favorite of ours. And you may recall that our friend Brian gave us a sketch of the Ninth Doctor by Ron Randall. We've been hearing Professor Allen talk about these comics on his shows at the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network, and it was great to have the opportunity to read them firsthand. Other titles included The X-Files and Coyote, so we've had tons of great reading this summer. The Professor obviously knows just the types of stories we enjoy. If you want to know more about our visit together, check out episode 8 of our Warlord Worlds podcast, which features Professor Allen as a guest. It was recorded at Heroes Con, and features an interview with Mike Grell, as well as conversations with other Mike Grell fans who were at the con. These include Jeff Messer from the Geek Brain podcast, Mike Lane from Comics in the Golden Age, and Terry and Ed Moore from the Mighty Thorcast. And check out the Geek Travels episode of Relatively Geeky Presents Professor Allen's 2016 Road Trip Podcast, which features us as guests talking about some of our geek travels, along with other guests including Tom Panarese of Pop Culture Affidavit and Stella from Batgirl to Oracle. We'll include links to those episodes in our show notes. Mark Sweeney of the podcast and blog I'm the Gun sent us a note about our last Trekker Talk episode. He said, I'm sad we've reached the end of the omnibus, as that is, to this point, the extent of my Trekker collection, and I will miss being able to follow along, especially as you describe your favorite artwork. Next, Mark said, I'm glad you mentioned The Trouble with Girls, as I've always kind of wanted to check it out. I've generally enjoyed the work of Gerard Jones, El Diablo, and Green Lantern Mosaic probably being my favorites. Your endorsement of Girls has most likely tipped the scales and will set me on the path to actually seeking it out. So I thank you but my wallet does not. Thankfully, Mark, the trouble with girls is so much fun, your wallet will forgive us. Mark continued, Lastly, Ruth, the Monkees was my first concert as well. I was at that perfect age to catch the second wave of monkey mania that accompanied the 20th anniversary tour and MTV reruns. 
I've been a lifetime fan and have, like yourself, been able to catch them live in a couple of different configurations. I love them all, but Mike was always my favorite, so it was an especially great experience for me to catch his solo tour a couple of years ago, as I was once resigned to the fact that I'd never see Mike Nesmith perform live. I was shocked when that tour was announced. And later, he did the absolutely unthinkable and toured with Mickey and Peter. I miss this latest tour, but really like the Good Times album. Tony Greenall let us know that he enjoyed our segment on Professor Allen's road trip episode. Tony has always been very kind to us on Twitter. Recently, he let us know our podcasts are among his favorites, and he listens to a ton of podcasts. Thanks for the compliment, Tony. Another time he posted that he often wonders what his favorite music is. Nirvana? Johnny Cash? Debussy? Or the opening to an episode of Trekker Talk? Tony also promoted a recent contest of ours where he encouraged listeners to do an iTunes review for a chance to win a prize. He let others know he has been a winner in the past when he got a print of Mercy signed by Ron Randall. He is enjoying the print every day and is thinking of moving it a foot to the left so the sun shines on it earlier. Joe Crawford posted on his blog, The Non-Discerning Reader, that it was a treat to see Ron Randall working on Astro City, and he also enjoyed hearing us on the other side of the mic when we were on Professor Allen's road trip show. Dr. G does a podcast called Welcome to Astro City over on Pulp to Pixel Podcast Network. We exchanged some messages about Ron's Astro City issues, and Dr. G said he'd really love to see more of Ron's work on Astro City. We received a wonderful gift in the mail from Dr. G as well, an Usagi Yojimbo trade paperback not only signed by creator Stan Sakai, but with an original sketch inside as well. Thank you, Dr. G. Dr. G saw some of our posts from our vacation and asked, Did you pick up any local comics? I always buy local comics when I travel abroad. I've been doing it since I was a kid and recommend it to any comic fan traveling abroad. Dr. G, I really like your idea of comics as souvenirs. We saw a couple of comics in gaming shops with nice displays but didn't make any purchases. We generally just bring back photos from our trips to save money and luggage space. But comics are small and lightweight and within our budget, so we just may add that tradition to our future travels. I'd be interested in finding titles that I don't know and seeing what the ads are like, too. We did see an ad during our travels for a new digital service called EuropeComics.com. We checked that site out, and it was very interesting, and we picked up a few titles. Ed Morse saw a share of print that Ron Randall did featuring Mercy St. Clair with Grindel, so he let us know there's a podcast about the Grindel comic books called The Devil in Your Ears for anyone who's interested. Our friend John Baker admired the wonderful detail of the recent Throwback Thursday panel of the Babel Canon that we posted. And regarding a panel with a spaceship from Trekker, he said, I do enjoy it when a black and white piece shines through. Something about the contrast. A great artist can make it dynamic and interesting. John's sister Ruth Reese spotted Scuff at a farmer's market, and she shared a photo to prove it. Ron Randall chimed in to say, that rascal gets around, he's popping up everywhere these days. Mark Sweeney shared an image drawn by Ron Randall of Sergeant Major Raymond Vaughn in Scout, issue number 10, from Eclipse Comics. Mark found several Easter eggs in it, including Warlord, Oregon, Baron Earth, Janal, and Carl Kiesel, and asked, does anyone see any others? Ron Randall was quick to reply, saying, I see plenty more, but I'll never tell. Brian Mulvey then joined in the hunt and spotted Arion, David Lindley, Tim Truman, and Tom Mandrake. Comic Reflections found a treasure in the 50-cent bins, the first five issues of Trekker, and now plans to start listening to the podcast. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy the show. We are grateful that Donovan Eilert, a host from Panel on Panels, contacted us to let us know they recently did an interview with Ron Randall. It is titled A Comic Trek. Just look for episode 75. The interview is great. We really enjoyed hearing more about Ron Randall's comic origin story, his Kubert School experience, and of course, Trekker. You'll find a link to the interview in our show notes. Panel on Panels covers lots of comic topics, and they have done some great interviews in the past. Next up in our queue is an interview with Steve Lieber, a studio mate of Ron's and artist of Whiteout, which is a favorite of ours. Check out their website. It has links to all their podcasts, a blog, and a few short films. I think you'll enjoy it. Thanks to those who took the time to write iTunes reviews. Ed Moore said, Trekker Talk is the first of the current shows from the Sutherland family of podcasts. Well produced. I dig the time you guys take walking through your favorite pages and panels the most. Carry on. Brian Mulvey said the Sutherlands are welcoming gatekeepers and knowledgeable guides to worlds you're going to want to be part of. Part of a trilogy of sorts, a podcast devoted to the work of three of Darren and Ruth's favorite comic professionals. Trekker Talk, covering the work of Ron Randall, is highly recommended. 
Thank you all for those great iTunes reviews. We appreciate it, Ed and Brian. We want to extend our Trekker thanks to everyone who supported us on social media since last episode. These are people who commented on or shared posts from us on Twitter, Tumblr, and Facebook. Your support helps draw attention to the podcast, and best of all, helps to spread the world about the Trekker series. And please consider leaving an iTunes review. It could help make the show even easier to find in searches. And speaking of iTunes reviews, we mentioned last time that we were having drawings to give away items to those who had done iTunes reviews for any of our shows. We had only one signed item remaining from Ron Randall, and the winner of that item is Ashford. Congratulations, Ashford. Ashford does the podcast Feathers and Foes, a Birds of Prey podcast, as well as Straight Out of Gallifrey, a Doctor Who podcast. Ashford's been a big supporter of Trekker Talk, and he'll be receiving a signed copy of The Train to Avalon Bay, which we'll be discussing on the show later this year. And please continue to submit those iTunes reviews. We hope to see Ron Randall at a con this fall, and we're going to pick up a few more signed items, and we'll have another drawing in a few months. So before we start, let me say if we miss a name, please let us know and we'll correct it in the next episode. And also forgive us if we mispronounce your name. Just email us and let us know. We'd be happy to correct that next time as well. Alan Wright from BoldOutlaw.com Albert Brooks Andrew Leland from Hey Kids Comics Ashford of Feathers and Foes, the Birds of Prey podcast Benito Fraza Brian Mulvey Bronze Age Babies Charlie Grafton Chris Dingsdell Chris Mounts Christopher Mills, Clinton Robson of the Coffee and Comics blog, Comic Reflections, Colin Stapleton from the Worst Comics Podcast Ever, and that's in name only, Dan O'Connor, Daryl Leaf, David Smith, Dr. G, Man of Nerdology of Pulp to Pixel Podcast, Terry Ed and Nick Moore of Till Productions, Eric Mannix from Out of the Fridge and Pages for All Ages, Felipe Miranda, Gene Hendricks from The Hammer Strikes, Gord Tolton, Ivan Henley, comics artist Jan Jersima, and check out our Kickstarter project, Hexter Dusk, Jason Johnson, Jeff Messer of Geek Brain Podcast, colorist Jerry McColwell, Jerry Gaga, Jesus Molina, Jim Hirsch, Joe Crawford of For the Non-Discerning Reader Blog, John Baker, John Pinto, Karim Ahmed Hamdan, Kenny Harris, Kyle Binning from King Size Comics and the Superman Captain Marvel Power Hour, Lance Barnett, Mark Ashcroft, Michael Carlisle from the Crap Box of Son of Cthulhu blog, Michael Chen, Michael Lane of Comics in the Golden Age, Nick Capone, Noel Byrne, Peter McCafferty, Preston Smith, Quadri Johnson, Richard Frost, Ron and Lynn Randall, Ryan Daly from the Power of Fishnets and Secret Origins podcasts, Sergio Mendez, Shag Matthews, a.k.a. Firestorm Fan, Thomas Machula, Tim Wallace from Cord Industries, a Blue Beetle blog, Tony Greenall, Travis Washington, Warren Montgomery of Will Lil Comics, and Zeb Oswald. It's time for the Trekker Toast Award, where we recognize someone who has gone above and beyond in supporting Trekker Talk. This person regularly shares many of our Facebook posts about Trekker, including posts about our episodes, as well as our posts about the new pages on Mondays and our Throwback Thursday post as well. She is also a great cook and a fellow fan of Renaissance festivals, so we have lots in common. So we lift our glasses and give a thankful Trekker Toast to Terry Moore. Congratulations, Terry. You know, since Terry hosts the excellent podcast, The Mighty Thorcast, about Marvel's Thor with her husband, Ed, it's almost as if we were saving this particular award just for this opportunity. No, we never plan anything that far in advance. I'm sure it was pure coincidence. Yes, I'm sure you're right. And we'll be right back after we play a couple of promos for other podcasts you might enjoy. Are you a geek looking for love? Do you long to find discussion on that special comic, TV, episode, movie, or toy that's just right for you? Then why not try Supermates, the husband and wife geek cast? Chris and Cindy Franklin can match you with that certain something to satisfy your genre-related longings, no matter the subject. Superheroes. But Robin's like, that was really nice of you, Batman. He's like, I had the room loaded with kryptonite. 
I can turn it on at any moment. <laughs> and here's the thing. It's, you're talking about... Now, think about this. It's an apartment building owned by Batman. Do you not think that Batman doesn't have their place but Sci-fi. I don't know. You talk about being a sex symbol and stuff like that. I mean, I know a lot of girls thought, you know... William Shatner was it, but I had a, the biggest crush on George Takai. I, 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 I did. I thought, you know. Sorry about that. <laughs> Horror. And then when we see the Wolfman for the first time, he's in, I don't know, we don't a know. A long sleeve shirt, shirt and a dark pair of pants. Pants with a belt. With a, with belt. a belt. That's right. <laughs> and his shirt's buttoned up all the way, too. Yeah, yeah. And his so, arms. So after he changes into this ferocious beast who can't talk, and doesn't seem to be able to think beyond just attacking things. He, he has lots of dex- dexterity. He went through his closet and... Uh, ah, no, 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 mm, mm, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I like this outfit better. Uh, Action figures. I actually had all the figures and all the accessories up to a certain point. I really literally did collect them all. You know. Including she I was going to get to that, but... Nah. Chris and Cindy have found their own happiness through discussions like this. I think I could be friends with him. I could be down with this version of the ultra humanoid. You could be friends with the dude who put his brain inside a mutated albino ape. I married you! <laughs> oh! If you're tired of searching for geek love, then sign up with Supermates for free at supermatescomic.blogspot.com or on iTunes. Greetings listeners, I am Dr. G, the man of nerdology. I host the Pulp to Pixel podcasts. I and my rogues gallery of co-hosts explore the media multiverse of geek culture with such shows as Welcome to Astro City and Secret Sagas of the Multiverse. Now I am proud to announce the newest addition to the Pulp to Pixel podcasts, Dial G for Gamer, a superhero gaming podcast. Dial G for Gamer will be a semi-monthly show where I and my co-hosts play and review games with a superhero theme. From tabletop games to video games, we will take on the genre one superhero game at a time. So if you love superheroes and gaming as much as we do, then tune in to Dial G for Gamer. You can find episodes of Dial G for Gamer with the other Pulp to Pixel podcasts through iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. You can follow us on Facebook at the Pulp to Pixel Podcasts. You can follow me on Twitter at Pulp to Pixel, where I go under the name Dr. G Neurologist. And you can find episodes directly at our blog, pulptopixel.blogspot.com. Man, you come right out of a comic book. The Pulp to Pixel Podcasts. Exploring the media multiverse of geek culture. It's time for What's Up, when we talk about other things going on outside of the world of Trekker. As we mentioned earlier, we recently went to Scandinavia. And again, I can't brag enough on Roos' budgeting skills, including using air miles to get our flights at no cost, as well as getting a great bargain on a nice tour package. We couldn't have afforded this trip otherwise. As Darren said, we cashed in some air miles and made our way to Scandinavia for a tour of the capital cities. We began in Stockholm, Sweden, then traveled by train to Copenhagen, Denmark, and finally took a ferry to Oslo, Norway. The cities and scenery were spectacular, and all were pedestrian-friendly, so we were out walking and exploring the cities every minute we could. The city of Stockholm is made up of 14 islands and is situated where a huge freshwater lake meets up with the Baltic Sea. As a result, the city is one-third water, and because of their love of nature, one-third of the city is devoted to parks and greenery, leaving only one-third for buildings and developed land. That's the perfect formula for a beautiful city, in my opinion. It allows for so many clear views across the water to see anything from medieval to modern-day architecture and amazing landscapes. I was delighted. Being so far north during the summer, the sun rises early and sets late, 
so there's about 20 hours of light each day that made it easy to be out early or late to enjoy the sightseeing. We ate well, and yes, Swedish meatballs and Swedish pancakes were great. We also saw lots of carts and stalls offering two-foot-long licorice whips all around the city. I also appreciated how easy it was to find ice cream, and Darren discovered a new favorite flavor, raspberry licorice ice cream. Several highlights in Stockholm were situated on a popular island with lots of museums, parks, and an amusement park. Sites included the Vasa Ship Museum, where a huge sailing ship from 1628 is on display. It was a revolutionary design at the time, but not fully realized and sank just after its launch, where it remained well-preserved under the cold water of the Baltic Sea for 333 years before it was raised and moved into this environment-controlled museum. There is also an open-air museum called Skansen, developed in the late 1800s, that preserves historic buildings from across the country. It is populated by people dressed in period costumes who demonstrate historic daily life. And we had great fun at the ABBA Museum. We're longtime fans and thought the displays were terrific, chronicling their solo work before they got together as a group all the way through the highs of their career and then continuing after their breakup to present day. The museum featured costumes and gold albums as well as part of their recording studio and a small piano where they used to compose music at a small cabin. There were several interactive stations where you could sing, try on virtual costumes, or dance and sing with a CGI version of the band. Now I really feel like listening to some Amba music. Mm, I'm with you there. Copenhagen is also on some islands and has many canals. We enjoyed walking all around the medieval and renaissance historic areas and admired the more modern public buildings like the Opera House that sits right on the harbor. We climbed up a tall 17th century tower that used a spiral walkway instead of stairs, making it very easy to walk to the top for a great view of the city and to see the observatory at the top. This city offered ethnic food from all around the world, and we visited an amazing food hall that's a combination of a farmer's market and lots of small food shops. We got the best tarts, fish and chips, and inventive salads there. The favorite find in this city was rhubarb soda. It was delicious, and we both had to go back the next day for another. The ferry ride was nicely done. It leaves Copenhagen late in the afternoon and arrives in Oslo the next morning. Because of this, you get to stay on deck and see the beautiful scenery of Denmark as you depart in the afternoon. Then you sleep in a cabin overnight while the ship is on open water. Then you get back up on deck the next morning for spectacular views of the fjords as you approach Oslo. We saw beautiful fishing villages dotting the coast and on little islands. Oslo is also a beautiful city with gorgeous waterfronts. It is filled with museums and open-air sculpture parks. Highlights included wandering around a 13th century fortress, walking around the roof of a modern opera house that is designed to look like a glacier, and going to the top of the Olympic ski jump for a stunning view of the area. We appropriately found a statue of a giant hammer, and while it wasn't technically a statue of Thor's hammer, it reminded us enough to make us smile. Food in Oslo included lunch at a cafe where great artists like Edvard Munch, who is famous for the painting The Scream, used to eat. Those of you who use air miles for travel know that sometimes it can be a challenge to put together an itinerary, and on our trip we had a 25-hour layover in London flying back. While that might not seem ideal to some people, we saw it as a great opportunity to spend a day in a wonderful city with a good friend. So our friend Paul, who lives in Belfast, flew over to London for the weekend. He spent one day visiting other friends he has in the area, and he spent one day with us. And since we're all fans of the British espionage series The Avengers, we spent the day on an Avengers treasure hunt. We used public transportation to make our way to a lovely historic village called Aldbury, about 45 minutes north of central London. It was featured in the Avengers TV show episodes Murdersville and Dead Man's Treasure, as well as many other shows over the years. It is lovely, with a pond on the village green, some half-timbered homes and thatched roofs and lovely gardens. It was lovely, and thank you, Paul, for making that trek to make our layover in London so special. Before we go, we want to provide our contact information. Please let us know your thoughts through email, Facebook, or Twitter. Also, if you like the show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes. Every review helps the show be more likely to show up in search results to help get the show noticed and perhaps attract more listeners to Grow Trek or Fandom. And please consider subscribing to the show so you always know when there's a new episode. We'd love to hear from you. So if you want to contact us directly, send us an email at trekkertalk at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr using the name Trekker Talk. And you can always visit trekkertalk.com for links to all of our social media pages. 
Please use hashtag TrekkerComic and hashtag TrekkerTalk in your messages to help other fans find and follow the conversations. And for those of you interested in the music that Ron Randall listens to while working on Trekker, he uses the hashtag TrekkerSoundtrack. Remember, at TrekkerComic.com, you'll find a new page every Monday, as well as links to all of the ways you can find Ron Randall. You'll see that he often replies to tweets and Facebook posts, as well as on his Patreon page. So post to his pages and let him and other fans know what you think of the new Trekker pages. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you'll come back next month for another new episode of Trekker Talk. Trekker Talk is a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. For more information, visit comicspodcast.com. We are not affiliated with Dark Horse Comics or Ron Randall. The views expressed on the show are solely ours. Music is taken from the album Royalty Free Music, Movies, and Videos from the Royalty Free Music Club. We make no money from this podcast and no copyright infringement is intended. (laughs) 